Hi everybody, welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to be reacting to top three places you can't go and people who went anyways, part 10. He has like a lot of parts um, to this, but uh, this is Mr. Ballin. He's uh, really cool. He tells stories in a really good way. Um, so yeah, get right into it. Anything more claustrophobia inducing and terrifying than being trapped in an underwater cave. That is, until I discovered today's top story. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please sneak into the like button's house and open up all of their cereal. But when you open the bags, make sure you tear them in such a way that you rip down the side of the bag, not along the intended seams at the top. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's story. I don't know why he like makes a story about <laughs> in the light. And isn't this the most extreme song? If you guys have never heard about that, it, it was um, a show on Animal Planet and it was like the most extreme animals and stuff. It was really cool. Daniel Dukes always seemed to have an issue with respecting boundaries. In 1996, when Daniel was 24 years old, he became obsessed with this video game series called Ultima, which in the early days of PC gaming was this huge hit. It was this open world role-playing fantasy game. Daniel figured out where the creator of this game lived. And in the middle of the night, in the spring of that year, he went to this guy's house and he knocked on the door. And when the creator did not answer the door, Daniel's frustrated and he leaves, but comes back a couple hours later and proceeds to break a window, climb inside this guy's house, he goes upstairs, and he goes into one of the bedrooms where he crawls into one of the beds and falls asleep. The next morning, when the creator got up, he finds Daniel laying in one of his beds, and he starts yelling at him to get out of his house, and Daniel's totally unfazed, and he just wants to sleep in this bed, and so the guy calls the police, the police show up, and Daniel's still in bed, and so they haul him out, and they arrest him. A year later, Daniel would be arrested again for trespassing, this time in Orlando, Florida at SeaWorld, where Daniel had, after hours, snuck into the manatee exhibit and was swimming around with the manatees because apparently he wanted to play with them. But despite his criminal history, Daniel was far from a hardened criminal. In fact, many people that knew him described him as a very gentle, pot-smoking hippie who just adored animals. In 1999, when Daniel was 27, he joined a small religious community of people that practiced Hare Krishna, which is a branch of Hinduism. They get their name from their chant, Hare Krishna, that devotees repeat over and over and over again. During his stay with this community, Daniel basically blew off all of his responsibilities. He didn't really practice the religion. He didn't help out around the temple. Instead, he spent virtually all of his time feeding the wild birds that came to roost in of the temple's garden and he kept this notebook where he diligently tracked who had come into the garden which bird and how much he had fed them and what they looked like basically all he cared about were these birds <laughs> after a month of living in the Hare Krishna community Daniel abruptly tells the other worshipers that he's going to be taking a vow of silence and this really confused the others because Hare Krishna does not encourage its members to take vows of silence this was something Daniel was just going to do on his own and so right before he took his vow of silence, he also informed them that he would be leaving. So he takes his vow of silence, he packs his stuff up, and he leaves. After departing, Daniel committed a series of petty offenses through South Carolina, Washington, Texas, and then ultimately in Florida. One of his offenses in Florida was stealing a candy bar at a 7-Eleven. And in court, because of his vow of silence that he was still living up to, he had to write on a piece of paper that he denied the charge but ultimately he was sent to jail for three days. After his stint in this Florida jail, Daniel gets out and he decides he wants to go back oh, to Orlando, he Florida can never, like, speak and again. go to the Sea World where he had previously jumped into the manatee exhibit. And so he was gonna go and presumably check out the manatees as well as some other animals. When he got to the park, he made his way over to the killer whale demonstration where some trainers were gonna be swimming around in this enclosure with these massive killer whales. And witnesses said they remember seeing Daniel in the stands watching the show being just totally transfixed 
and open-mouthed and fascinated with what he was looking at. But apparently Daniel's biggest reaction to any part in the show was when the trainers brought out Tilikum, the biggest killer whale ever held in captivity, measuring over 22 feet long and weighing over 12,000 pounds. Daniel was just totally taken with Tilikum. So that night, after the park shut down and everyone went home, Daniel came back, now wearing a bathing suit. He hops the fence and he sneaks back into SeaWorld the same How way he, he did a couple years earlier when he snuck into the manatee Sneaking in and nobody's seen And somehow seen he managed to go through the park without being picked up on a camera. And he makes his way mm -hmm. over to the killer whale enclosure. He hops the fence, he takes off his shirt, takes off his shoes. So he's just got his bathing suit on and he jumps into the massive pool with Tilikum. When Daniel jumped into the manatee exhibit, he had said he just wanted to play with the manatees. And so it's assumed that when he jumped in with Tilikum, he just wanted to play with Tilikum. And apparently Tilikum was really eager to play with Daniel because Tilikum quickly played with Daniel by biting his shorts and bringing him to the bottom of the pool and dragging him along the bottom until Daniel drowned. And then after he drowned, Tilikum basically thrashed him around, throwing him up and down, ripping off pieces of him, until finally he mm. draped Daniel's body over his back, and that's where Tilikum kept him. The next day, when the staff showed up and made this discovery, they couldn't get Daniel's body away from Tilikum because Tilikum wanted to keep his toy. And so they had to use a special medical hoist to lift Tilikum up into the air to recover Daniel's body. Daniel's death was ruled an accident as a result of his poor decision-making, and so as such, Tilikum was not punished. What in the name? In 1910, miners drilling inside of the Nika Cave in Chihuahua, Mexico, punctured through the ground and discovered this flooded cavern. After pumping the water out and stepping inside of this cavern, they were amazed to see these massive gypsum crystals that had formed on the walls and the ceiling all over this cave. Although the crystals were beautiful, they were far less valuable than what these miners were after, which was silver. So instead of trying to, you know, mine out these crystals, they told the locals in the area that they had found this cave and that they really ought to come down here and protect it because it's this amazing natural wonder. And so for the next hundred years, the locals in Chihuahua, Mexico, basically kept this cave that they nicknamed the Cave of Swords under lock and key so that no one would go in there and destroy these amazing crystals. Fast forward to the year 2000 and uh -huh. two men are inside of this mine, not the Nika mine where the Cave of Swords is located, but a mine that was right up against it. And they're drilling down and they're actually at the same level of where the Cave of Swords is located. And they don't know it yet, but they're drilling underneath the Cave of Swords. And they eventually puncture into the rock, revealing this underground flooded cavern. Now these two men are not tracking that this is right underneath the Cave of Swords. So they're not thinking there could be crystals inside of this flooded cavern. They're thinking there could be silver down there. So after pumping all the water out of this cavern, they crawl down inside and it opens up into this massive cavern with these enormous crystals coming out of the ceiling, the walls everywhere. That's and they crazy. are like 10 times, 15 times bigger than any of the biggest crystals inside of the Cave of Swords. These are literally the biggest crystals in the world. And this cavern looks like Superman's Fortress of Solitude. It's this unbelievable landscape. This new cave would be dubbed the Giant Crystal Cave, and like its counterpart, the Cave of Swords, it would be handed over to locals to protect. Now you'd think people would be lining up like crazy to get inside either of these two caves to see these natural wonders. That's crazy. But the truth is, nobody wants to go inside of these caves because they're death traps. Even though both of these caves have had the what? water drained out of them, their humidity level is still 100% which means if you're in there too long in either of these two caves, you run the risk of your lungs starting to fill with water, effectively drowning you. In mm -hmm. fact, scientists speculate what? that it would take about 10 minutes for this to happen to you if you were inside one of these caves, assuming you were not wearing a special breathing device that was pumping dry air back into you. But even if you were wearing these special air crazy. tanks, the cave would still kill you in about an hour because the temperature exceeds 130 degrees Fahrenheit. And so if you combine the extreme Damn. heat with the humidity and the tight enclosed nature of an underground cave, you have a natural oven that if you stay in there too long, it will cook you alive. Mm. So the only people that go inside of these caves are researchers that wear all the special equipment and they only go inside for a couple of minutes at most. But in 2001, so one year after the discovery of the big crystal cave, 
one of the workers who helped drain out the big crystal cave decided, you know what, I want a crystal for myself. And so using his understanding of the mine and his access to this particular section of the mine, he made his way down and got inside of the big crystal cave. Now, the only special equipment he had was a saw because he figured he could get in there and saw off a what? piece of one of these crystals take and get out of there in just a couple of minutes, certainly well equipment. before anything bad would happen to him. So he gets inside, he identifies the crystal he wants, and he starts sawing off the bottom of this crystal. But it dislodges a huge chunk of the crystal that falls on him. Mm. Now, when it fell on him, that didn't kill him, but it pinned him inside of this cave. At this point, reality must have sunk in very quickly for this guy. He didn't tell anyone where he was going because what he was doing was illegal. And he knows that nobody checks inside of these caves to see if people are trapped or stuck because they don't expect people to go into these caves and they're off limits. A couple of days later, researchers went down into Big Crystal Cave and they discovered this guy still pinned underneath the big crystal he had cut from the ceiling. It was unclear whether he had died from drowning or from being cooked alive, but either way, he was deceased. To this day, Big yeah. Crystal Cave and the Cave of Swords are strictly off limits to the public. I'm so on June 30th, 2002, an 18-year-old named Daniel Dick was on vacation with his mother and his two younger brothers in Hawaii. Daniel had just graduated from his high school in Los Angeles, where he was the student body president. He was known to invite all of his classmates over to his house all the time for dinners, and girls would call him all the time to try to get advice about their boyfriends. And Daniel also would befriend troubled teens in an attempt to kind of pick them up and get them back on the straight and narrow. When he and his family left for this vacation, he had been working part-time at a grocery store and was getting ready to attend California State University in the fall. That morning, Daniel went down to the beach where he planned on doing some swimming and maybe laying out in the sun for a little bit. And pretty quickly, he met three girls. And after about 30 minutes of chatting with them, he asked them if they wanted to climb over the fence and check out the blowhole. A blowhole is a fairly narrow hole that is situated on rocks right near where water is crashing. And this hole is usually formed by molten lava that is passed through underneath. And what happens is this hole is connected to a tunnel that feeds down and out into the water. So when the waves come in, they go through this tunnel and they get rocketed up this little opening, causing a massive geyser of water. Now, if you don't go near the blowhole, it's not dangerous at all. It's just a very cool natural phenomenon. The beach that Daniel and these girls were on was situated right near an infamously dangerous blowhole called the Halona blowhole. The reason it was so dangerous is because the water it connected to through that tunnel was some of the most violent in all of Hawaii. So when those waves came barreling through the tunnel, it would shoot 30 plus feet in the air. And so to make sure everybody understood you're only allowed to watch the blowhole from a distance, they actually put up a fence all the way around it and put up signs saying, do not go any closer. To give you a sense of how powerful the water was that was churning through this tunnel, if you were standing on the other side of the fence watching the blowhole from a safe distance, you could feel the ground shaking as the waves would rumble through the tunnel and then explode out of the blowhole. According to Daniel's family Why and friends, he was not a reckless person. He was yeah. just a very adventurous person. And so something oh like God. this blowhole really piqued his interest. And he just couldn't handle being on the outside of the fence. He really wanted to get right up there and get a look at it. In fact, he told these girls he wanted to feel the power of the water hit him in the chest. That was his plan. The girls told him this was a bad idea, but he was insistent and he began walking over to the rocks where he could climb up and jump this fence. The girls went with him, but they stopped short of the fence. As Daniel made his way over to the rocks, he passed by a couple that was laying on the beach. He waved to them, he climbed up the rocks, he climbed over the fence, and he made his way over to the blowhole. And he timed it no. to where a wave had just come in and shot a geyser up. And then as soon as the water went down and there was a break, he walked over the edge of this hole that was not very far across. And he kind of arched himself over it so his chest was hovering right over where the water was going to come up. And initially a wave came through and the water shot up and it hit him in the chest and it kind of staggered him back for a minute. And at this point, the three girls and the couple that he had passed are now yelling for him to get away from the blowhole that it's way too dangerous. But it was too late. He leaned back over the blowhole right as a massive wave came barreling through the tunnel. It rocketed up and it lifted him off the ground about five feet in the air and it turned him upside down so his head is pointed down. And when he fell, he went directly into the blowhole. 
The couple and the oh, three girls wait. that saw this happen described his body position as being the perfect dive. And in order to actually get into the blowhole, you would need the perfect body position because the opening is very narrow and it goes down eight feet of just this narrow, narrow tube. And at the bottom of that, it opens up like the inside of a teapot. And inside of there is this just vicious churning water that connects to this underground tunnel that feeds out to the sea. And so when Daniel went head first down, his momentum along with his perfect body position forced himself down through that hole into that section that's kind of like the inside of a teapot. And once you're inside, there's no way to go back up again. The opening is too tight and there's nothing to hold on to. You wouldn't have the ability to force yourself up through that hole again. So the only way out is through the underground tunnel that leads out to the sea. But there are constantly waves pounding their way up this tunnel into the section where Daniel had fallen into. And so realistically, anybody that tries to swim through this fairly long underground tunnel is only going to get so far before a wave forces them back or traps them in some way in this underground tunnel. As soon as Daniel went into the blowhole, the couple and the three girls immediately climbed up the rocks, hopped over the fence, and began looking into the tunnel, yelling for Daniel. And as they're sitting there yelling for him and yelling for people on the beach to call 911, they would feel the ground start to shake as another wave would come through the tunnel and erupt through the blowhole. And they know every time that happened, Daniel, if he was alive, he was completely submerged in water for 30 seconds or so every iteration that this blowhole erupted. By the time the police showed up, Daniel has been trapped inside of this blowhole for some time and no one's heard him, no one's seen him, and so it's starting to look pretty grim. And the police would say it's nearly impossible for anybody to survive being inside of this blowhole, especially at high tide, which is when he went in. In fact, the police would say, we can't even send divers in there until low tide, because if we send someone in now, they're gonna get killed inside of this blowhole. It's too violent inside of there. And so the best they could do was put a weighted line into the blowhole anchored on the outside, so that if by some miracle Daniel was still alive, he'd be able to grab this line and pull himself up. He probably would not be able to pull himself through the hole to safety but at least he could keep himself out of the water until rescuers could get there the next day at low tide. But next when low day. tide came the next day and divers went out to the water, they discovered Daniel's body. It was floating near the area where water actually gets sucked into the tunnel and out through the blowhole. During low tide, he must have been pulled back out through the tunnel out to sea. It's unclear how long Daniel was alive once he landed inside oh of the blowhole God. or whether he ever attempted to actually swim through that tunnel out to sea but at some point he did drown. Daniel's mother petitioned to have a metal grate put over the blowhole so that nobody else would fall in and meet the same fate as her son. But this proposal was met with criticism from the locals who said the problem was not the blowhole, the problem was people not respecting the power of nature. And so while a fence still surrounds Holona blowhole telling people to stay back, the entrance to the blowhole is still uncovered. So that's gonna do it guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it. So give us the timestamp. Uh, yeah. And if you're the first to do that, we will pin you at the top of the comments section. If you enjoyed the Well, that's terrible. I mean, that's why, you know, people should definitely listen to, especially if it's like in nature, especially if there's like warning signs everywhere saying like, do not cross, it's dangerous, it's probably. For a reason that was sad. I mean, he looked like a nice kid, but um, yeah, I'm gonna be doing more of these videos. He's really entertaining. He has a ton of videos. If you guys have any stories you would like to share, put them in the comments. I would love to hear from you. Um, and yeah, I'll see you guys next time.